Welcome to the Volvo Ocean Race. It is day 13 of leg four between Melbourne and Hong Kong. On The Daily Show, we have Xabi Fernandez, skipper of Mafre. We have Harry Spedding from Turn the Tide on Plastic. But first off, a man overboard incident on Sung Hun Kai Scallywag. Check out this video of the recovery of uh, crew member Alex Go. Hey, brother. Hey, go and shake. He's playing shake. Okay, copy. Okay, sheet on. Sheet on. Straight up. It's very hard to slow down, remember? Yeah, we're going to use the engine to slow down to get in. Uh, yeah, so we, went, we were peeling to go from the throw back to the mo, and Joey went out on the outrigger. I think, I think the sheet was tangled on the end of it. But in those situations, you should, one, either be tethered on, or two, at a minimum, tell the driver what you're doing so he knows. Uh, he didn't do either of those. Went out on the other rigger I was driving and uh, we went off a big sea and just picked the back up and just threw him off like a off a horse, you know. The main thing is we got him back on board, he's safe. Um, I, mean, I think it just showed everyone how hard it is to actually see the guy in the water. Even in Sunday, you know, 18 knots and sunshine. You, know, you wouldn't want to be trying to do it in 20, 20 knots in the dark. I don't think you'd find him, you know. Up there, up there, up there. Okay, engine on, engine on. Engine on. Engine on. Engine on. Engine on. Engine on. Show me the line, son. Show me the line. Show me the line. Help, help. Okay, it's right, all go. It's kind of one of those days where it's not too, it's not actually that rough, but it's kind of still going pretty quick. So yeah, I was just pretty stupid, and luckily the boys were onto it, got me back on pretty quick. So yeah, credit to the lads. They turned around bloody quick, got it all filled up, and heading back to me in I don't know 30 seconds. So it's all good. <laughs> yeah, I'm good. I'm fine. Yeah. It's a bit scary, but a bit stupid, but anyway. That's what it is. Off we go again. Small knots wind and black, you're dead. Okay? Only reason we found you is you put your arm in the air. Okay? It is what it is. It's done now. But yeah, just gotta be more careful. Well, that was a close call. Thank goodness he's all right. Anyway, misadventures aside, the black boat is still in the lead as the southerly option continues to pay for Sung Hun Kai Scallywag. Let's have a look at the fleet to see how it's shaping up. Zooming in on the boats, we can see that the fleet is currently working hard in beautiful conditions this time. Charging their way, jiving through the coral atolls of the Micronesian Peninsula. The boats at the back were the ones that got well, frankly, screwed over by the, um, by the last cloud coming out of the doldrums, but you can see that Mafre is already extending on their compatriots, uh, Brunel, and turn the tide on plastic. Pausing here, we can see that the archipelago here and the, and the coral atolls, for example, this one here, which is the Chuk Lagoon, represent challenges, but also opportunities. You can see that... Um, uh, Mafre here have a smoother line and instead of doing a, a jibe like Vesta's 11th hour racing are starting to close in again on the leaders. Looking forward, all the different weather models and indeed all the different routing software show that Sung Hun Kai Scallywag will hold a slender lead when the fleet converges by the northern Philippines. However, there's, uh, as we say, there's a lot more golf in this hole because there's a high pressure zone uh, extending off uh, the eastern coast, um, the eastern coast of, of China, and we can see that there's a little bit of divergence here. There's less pressure up at the top, and so maybe all the boats that have been working hard to get north may actually be penalised by those extra miles. It's going to be tough to see uh, exactly what happens as the boats approach Hong Kong. Um, Sung Kung Kai out in the lead, everybody else chasing hard. But speaking of chasing hard, I spoke with Shabby Fernandez, skipper of Mafre, who's working to get back in the chase. Finally moving properly towards the finish line, uh, doing about 20 knots and done win. So happy days. I think uh, we had a very last, uh, very tough last week. Uh, now slowly, slowly 
you know, uh, with the speed, the uh, smiles coming back to their faces. Can you tell us, in your words, how, just how hard the, these last doldrums were? Well, they have been very hard, really, you know, uh, a part, of course, of the outcome, which has been uh, punishing us uh, way too hard, in our opinion, but, uh, you know, it's been hard, uh, really no win at all, and so hot. And, you know, we've been through, most of us, we've been through a couple of times already, and it's been by far the worst time uh, we ever crossed the equator. So it's been it's been hard, and then, uh, of course, seeing how the others were living before us, and we were just doing a sketch of average in less than two knots, it was uh, pretty frustrating, really. Uh, you're in fifth place, you've been here before, and you've yeah. retaken the lead. What options uh, remain in this league for you? Well, we know, we know it's hard, and it's difficult to 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 go back in touch with the guys in front because it's, uh, they have a, a big distance with us but of course we will keep fighting uh, now we're going around an atoll which uh, we're hoping not to jive and, and hopefully get some distance back from the guys they have jived and then uh, you know play our options uh, let's say uh, if something is uh, clear is that the the weather focus are not being very accurate and such an unstable place hopefully some options uh, they get open for us but uh, you know we have to be realistic we have to make sure uh, we, we we you know don't lose anymore um there's nobody else listening it's just you and me shabby can you tell me some of your secrets what are you doing differently yeah. and uh, <laughs> uh does that give you confidence for the rest of the league <laughs> well i'm not gonna tell you anyway but uh <laughs> Uh, I think, uh, I don't know, uh, things are, you know, we, we are happy with our things are going okay and give us some confidence. We are realistic as well anyway and, and you know, we're not going to make uh, illusions and, and we know that 100 miles is way too long distance but, uh, you know, we know we're fast, we're stretching the guys behind which is good and hopefully, as I said before, we have some weather helping us and, and we could catch uh, any of them. This confidence in your boat speed, did that come from all of your experience in the last race or the, the testing that you did before this edition? A lot uh, is coming from the last race. Uh, don't forget, and I always say that four of us, we're selling this boat around the wall already. And I think this is giving us a lot of the testing we have done uh, uh, for the race. Uh, you know, not only with Onfem, but uh, even Leg Zero was very, very useful for us. Uh, I think we played pretty clever there, trying a few different things and uh, you know we found a little thing here and there and and now we still uh, have a, a good performance of course we know that this gap is going to be smaller and smaller and that's why uh, you know it's for us it's a shame to to lose an opportunity in this leg to do better but, uh, but you know uh, it's not finished yet and uh, as i said before we will push hard all the way and good luck for the miles to come and i know that you'll be pushing hard yeah thank you very much thank you Xavier Fernandez clearly delighted to be back underway and in the chase. But moving now from skipper to shore crew, just before coming on here, I spoke with Harry Spedding, a key member of DeCafari's team and Turn the Tide on Plastic, to ask him about the size of their team, the effect of that, and all of the other elements that go into keeping a high-performance team out on the water. We don't have the smallest team, um, partly because we've got a big group of youngsters. So we actually have 14 sailors. Um, we have 10 on the boat at any one time which is bigger than any other team because we've got the, the mixed crew of five and five. Uh, we then have uh, three full-time in the office, and then there are people like myself and, and, and Sean and a few others who come in and help at, at different times. Uh, and we have four on the boat, uh, the, the shore team, the technical shore team, um, led by Fletcher Kennedy. He was with Team SCA and Ericsson and various others. And... Um, I think the advantage of having a small team is we can react quite quickly, um, easier communications. Uh, we don't have the commercial pressures of Dong Fong Race Team with one big sponsor. Um, Axon Noble, I imagine, are pretty similar to that. Um, that said, we have a lot of smaller, highly enthusiastic sponsors, so uh, we do need to be able to look after them. Um, with the Mirpuri Foundation, Sky Ocean Rescue, OFF, you know, it, it, it all keeps going. They all need to be looked after and respected. And, and so that takes time. Um, but uh, the, the nice thing about the small team is, is being able to keep that family feel. You've been with Dee um, both on a professional and personal level for, for many, many years. And you've seen her go through uh, solo projects like the Vendée Globe, the Barcelona World Race. Uh, being a crew member in the Volvo Ocean Race and now a skipper. Can you tell us a little bit about uh, sort of her journey as a sailor and, and uh, the key moments that you've seen in her evolution? Yeah, sure. I mean, I think 
um, what she's doing now is probably the, the biggest thing she's done. And, and that includes Solo, Wrong Way Round, and then the Vendée Globe. Um, in terms of big changes for her, the Vendée Globe was a massive step up in being a professional athlete rather than an adventurer. Um, and then uh, the Volvo was a big learning experience with Team SCA. But, but this one, uh, leading a, a group of less experienced sailors in the Volvo Ocean Race is, is a huge, huge project for her. To be honest, when people were talking about the formation of the secondary low in the Southern Ocean prior to the start of uh, leaving Cape Town, that's the first time in a long time that I've actually seen the full weight of responsibility sitting visibly on her shoulders. Um, and um, I know she referred to it sort of a week, 10 days into the leg of, of, you know, it actually made her feel physically sick, having that responsibility of, of the youngsters on board. And can you talk to us a little bit about the objectives of Turn the Tide on Plastic? Most notably, that they're carrying this incredible uh, and powerful ecological message uh, on, on board the sails and indeed around the world. Uh, but in terms of the development of the team, is she looking to try and get a, develop her status to get a result in this uh, edition of the race, or is it all about building youngsters for the future? So uh, two aspects here. One is the cause-led sponsorship, which is something that we've talked about for, for years, but it's always, uh, it's been a difficult one to, to sell. Um, and led by Anne-Cecile Turner and the sustainability project within the Volvo Ocean Race, you know, this has just come together at a, at a, an immaculate time, as it were. Um, is D looking to have a performance results within the Volvo Ocean Race? 100%. Um, was she leaving Alicante thinking she was going to win the race? No. But that doesn't mean that they're not aiming to be on the podium as the race progresses. And, you know, for sure, as, as they were entering the doldrums, they caught up with the fleet. And, you know, I actually think they were starting to believe they could do it on this leg. Um, they certainly think that they should not be just sitting in sixth and seventh place on every leg. By the time they're halfway through this race, they want to be fighting towards the front of the fleet. We'll return to Harry in just a moment, but here's a snapshot of all the other action out on the water. We just lost four miles to Dong Feng. Pretty hard to tell you exactly how long since we came around the Solomons. I think about four or five days of drifting around, so it's um, not been much fun at all. We had quite a long chat with Harry earlier and we just wanted to throw in one more answer that we got from him because I think it's really valuable. I asked him about team psychology on board and how you prepare mentally for, for facing the challenges at sea. Now, just before we came on air, we were talking about uh, the fact that, that Dee came, or became a believer in the idea of, of mental preparation, mental coaching uh, yeah. during the course of her Vendée Globe campaign. Uh, can you give us a little bit of a window into that? Yeah, sure. Um, so when we were building up to the Vendée Globe campaign with Aviva back in 2008, which seems like ancient history now, um, <laughs> one of the groups we worked with was um, Leeds Carnegie University, which is where Dee did her... Um, teacher training and her, her degree and we worked on a whole number of things from the physical aspect uh, we did research into sleep we did research into nutrition and the sports psychology became a really important part of that and and when Dee first went to to meet the sports psychologist she almost had to be forced into it and she went for 45 minutes and she came out saying well I just spoke for half an hour and then he told me exactly who I am <laughs> and she was really shocked by how quickly he got an insight into her um, and then we worked, we worked with him for the following 18 months um, to ensure that actually what we spoke about earlier with the emotional highs and lows, we're trying to level those out. Um, and a major aspect of leveling those out is um, sleep and nutrition. Um, if you have an emotional low, you are probably tired or hungry and it's your body telling you. Um, and then the other aspect is actual positive reinforcement. Um, that comes in two ways. One is going to your happy place. 
um, uh, Johnny Wilkinson is a classic example of this. He had a, a very um, obvious stance that he would take before taking a, a kick at goal. And, uh, you know, it, it was a habit. It, we, what he was doing was visualising. So that's one thing you can do. Not so easy uh, on an offshore boat that's moving all the time and, and you haven't got 30 seconds to, <laughs> to stop and concentrate. Yep. Uh, but the other one is uh, verbal reinforcement. So you don't talk about uh, we're going slow. We talk about how do we go faster. Mm. We don't talk about not wanting to come last. We talk about wanting to do better. Uh, and those two things, so the, the sleep and nutrition, the energy levels, um, and then the positive reinforcement are, are really important. Thanks very much for your time. I appreciate your insight. Thanks, Colin. Cheers, mate. That's all for today. Thank you for spending your Sunday with me and the Volvo Ocean Race. We'll be back again tomorrow uh, with a quick fix followed by The Daily Show. See you then. Thank <laughs> you.